Since 1990, we have spent millions of euros and tens of thousands of research hours to find scientific answers to life's most important and challenging questions. What makes us happy? What makes us healthy? How can we heal from physical and mental disease? How can we heal emotionally and sexually so we can be happy in our relationships? How can we develop our talents and be of value to the world? We have interviewed more than 15,000 people and asked more than 4,000 different questions. After 20 years of intensive research, we are beginning to find the answers we have been looking for for so long. We have already presented these answers in 250 research papers and about 30 books. Now we bring it all up to you. Holistic medicine addresses all aspects of the human existence. Mind, body, spirit, uh, social network, philosophy of life, uh, feeling, sexuality. Um, it's, it's an old thing. It's not a new thing. It was invented by the old Greek doctors 2,500 years ago and described in about 70 books, uh, 500 before Christ. So, uh, it has a long history and the way it's used today is pretty much the same way as it was used by the old Greeks, which is amazing when you think about it. We have tried to systematize the tools of the holistic medicine in this old, this ancient Hippocratic tradition. And we have identified 10 levels uh, of, of, uh, uh, of, of difficulty, you could say. So, uh, there, are, there are easy things to use for a therapist and then there are difficult things to use. And in general, the more force you're using, the more difficult it is, the, the bigger tool it is, and the more are you risking to, to traumatize and damage your patient. For instance, the old Greek doctor said that you could not use drugs, uh, minerals and herbs uh, to the mouth, because these uh, things are so forceful, so powerful, that they most likely will damage the body. So this is why they said that all these things can only be used on the skin. You cannot, you cannot uh, give them to the patient to drink or eat. Uh, so, so they were very, very aware of, of, this, of this system of, uh, of intervention. And they always recommended the use of as, as little force as possible. They said, if the better doctor you are, the less force you need to help your patient. So, uh, there's a system of steps uh, where, where you can say you can step up to the next level uh, if the first uh, smaller step is not working for you and your patient. And so so let's, let's look at these steps. The first step, the easiest one, is to talk, to meet and talk. And uh, for the extremely good physician, or service. This is all it takes to to help. You talk, you meet, you look at things, you increase your understanding, you explore you know, the patient together with the patient, and this self-exploration, this increased understanding solves the problem. Um, but uh, often the therapist is not good enough to make this work. So more closeness is needed. Some feelings are withheld in the patient, some traumas from the past are not uh, exposed, are not seen. So the next concept is closeness. If it's not enough to talk, you need to, to develop a relationship. Uh, you need to get closer. In a way, you re-establish the patterns of, of the patient's uh, family. You become, in a way, a father, mother, brother, sister a child, a relative uh, in the play of this patient. So, so we call this intimacy, that you get intimate. But as, as I said, the really good doctor 
doesn't have to go there. Uh, the third step is called holding or support. Uh, very often the patient play as a wounded child and the wounded child never got enough awareness, enough acceptance, enough love and, and, and physical contact. So in step three the patient steps in as the parent of the patient and gives the love and support the, the patient didn't receive as a wounded child, uh, that is in, in early childhood. Uh, and uh, this is extremely effective therapy. And in my experience, most, most patients can be helped on this level, uh, even by, by a mediocre therapist. Uh, that is, if you're not very good, you're not very empathic, you're not very loving, you're not very wise, then if you are able to embrace and support your patient, this is already good. If, you, if you're not that good, if you're not that good, that healing happens spontaneously in the interaction where you're just uh, are talking and watching, then you can go to step four, which is called healing the patient. And there you are stepping into the role as a healer of the patient. The patient becomes a patient and you become the doctor or the therapist, and now you're playing as the doctor and the, uh, uh, and the patient, the therapist and the client. And uh, in a way this is fairly stupid because, because uh, in the end it's the patient that heals him or herself through un uh, increased understanding. But in this play uh, you accept this level of ignorance that the patient is a helpless patient and you are the savior and you are healing the patient by taking the patient back in time, going through traumas, uh, integrating feelings, uh, working on the body where there are problems. Um, and it works wonders. It works wonders. Uh, if, if this is what it takes. So it, it's like, if, if the first three steps are not working, then you need to do something else. So step into the role as a healer and heal your patient. But no, it's only in the play and it's not true. Um, the fifth level is a social, is uh, is a social intervention. The, f the fifth step, if you have been working with a patient alone, and you haven't really uh, been helping much, then you can work on the social relationships, the uh, social identity, the relationship w w with members of the family and friends. Uh, sometimes it's done by inviting the partner or the parents uh, or, 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 or friends even uh, into, the, uh, in, into the situation and you are uh, discussing what's happening and, and how things are and you're trying to uh, make everybody help this person by, uh, by, by sharing and exploring. And, and uh, of course it's a bigger tool as now you're involving the, the patient's world. You're not only working with the patient. Uh, but you can also see that this is quite uh, dramatic because you know, the moment you're doing this there will be a diagnosis uh, shared by everybody. This patient is sick, has this problem uh, and uh, there will be a label and uh, marginalization uh, which is like a social traumatization. So this is a, a very big tool which must be used with the greatest of care because it's potentially very harmful. Uh, and this, this goes for, for the next techniques. They are, they are in a way potentially harmful and they must be, be used with great care. Uh, the next step is philosophical intervention. Now you are intervening on the whole philosophy of the patient, the way everything is understood and seen. Uh, him or herself, the world, life, sexuality, love, all these things. You are, you are intervening on the philosophy of life and in, in reality you are making what could be called a, a brain touch plant or something. You are taking the consciousness of the patient and you are substituting it with a different understanding, <clears throat> with a different viewpoint. And of course this can be extremely harmful if what you are teaching the patient is sheer bullshit, which is oftenness. So all these uh, things like positive thinking and these things, it's very much like you are putting uh, a nice glazing on a bad cake <clears throat> and then you're trying to make it nice. Uh, you're trying to improve 
something that is not working by uh, corrections. While the only thing that really helps is to to find the problem and solve it. So, so you know, it's intervention and philosophy of life is must also be done in great care. And actually, it's very difficult not to intervene on on the patients or clients' philosophy because everything you say will will give a push unless you are extremely pure and and explorative and not like saying much but only listening, which is. Uh, the classical advice to therapists: Don't interpret. Don't say anything. Just listen and be with your your, your patient, the client, and, uh, and and that's it. <clears throat> the problem. That's the, the technique, basically, of uh, psychoanalysis and these things. So the problem is that that uh, bad therapists cannot make this work. So the patient will go there for ten years without any you know, significant progress. So if you are a bad therapist, don't waste your patient's time and money. But step the game up and 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 work and work on these with these bigger tools. That is a must if you're not going to leave your practice. Which might be a wiser thing to do. Um, but it's difficult to, to to give that advice, of course. Um, the ne the next step is even more more dangerous and difficult. This is body work. Um, the body holds the score. The body holds the emotions. Every trauma, every painful life event we have is anchored in the body through an emotion that is held by some tissue, normally a muscle that keeps it in a tension. So we can go in and work on the body, find the tensions, massage them, and in this way make all these difficult emotions surface to the, uh, to, to, to the consciousness of the patient so they can be explored and understood. But of course, intervening directly on the patient's body uh, to uh, release feelings is an extremely powerful tool. It's very, very efficient, highly efficient. And as a therapeutic tools, it must really be recommended when you cannot make the other things work. Uh, and, and then many therapists today are so hopeless that they just jump into body work immediately because they know that they cannot in any way say anything that would help anybody. So, if this is the case, of course, use body work. It's wonderful. Uh, the next, the next step is like the extreme body work. Now you are working directly with the two forces uh, of existence: love and sexuality. And many, many problems, also mental problems, are actually of sexual nature. So you need to help the patient explore. Uh, sexuality and, 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 and all the issues around sexuality. And what the Greek doctors did was uh, they diagnosed mental illness uh, of women as uh, hysteria. They called it hysteria. And it comes from, came from the word hystera, which means the womb. So they believed that all mental illness, uh, illnesses had uh, imbalanced sexuality as its cause. And to balance the sexuality, they, they massage the womb. They penetrate the vagina and they massage the womb uh, and, the, uh, and the genitals and help the woman integrate all the shame and guilt and bad feelings uh, associated with the body and sexuality, all kind of disgust and, and all, all these negative feelings. And it, uh, it was an extremely effective thing and it was actually practiced by most uh, doctors uh, for 2,300 years, it stopped around 1800, and still, uh, in the uh, around uh, 1900, uh, many doctors practice, practice this uh, vaginal massage, uh, often called uh, vaginal acupressure, uh, Hippocratic uh, pelvic massage, etc. Uh, today, uh, we have it in a in a very clinical form. We call it. Uh, physical therapy for the pelvic floor, and uh, Professor Burinow have uh, recently published a book documenting that this is extremely effective, rational, and evidence-based medicine even today. So it's still it's still uh, in use uh, today, but of course it's a big tool, and we need to understand how big tool it is. It's uh, really a radical tool. Uh, if you go to men, they're similar radical tools. Very often they are. They're quite violent. 
they are. Uh, um, uh, for instance, uh, yeah, they're, they're very close to martial arts, <laughs> and, <laughs> and very often you're bruised and and, and red and blue uh, after these uh, sessions. So, so uh, they're basically role plays where you're confronting your father, fighting with him, etc. Uh, so, so, um, so uh, there are these really big steps where you can go into deep existential therapy, but uh, but do it wisely. Uh, they create a lot of smoke and problems. And uh, in Denmark, uh, uh, I've worked with myself, and it has created a lot of. Uh, of critique, no. so be wise. Uh, the next step, step nine, uh, is uh, what we call uh, mind expanding techniques. Here you go beyond the ego, you are transcending the ego. And the classical tool is the uh, psychotropic drug, the hallucinogenic drug, like magical mushrooms. Uh, psilocybin, uh, um, scopolamine uh, from the datura plant, uh, ayahuasca, uh, which has an LSD-like effect. These, these uh, strong, uh, strong uh, hallucinogenic drugs. And what uh, they do for the patient is that they take the patient uh, on an inner journey where you can explore. Uh, your, your your existence, your consciousness, your life, your past, everything becomes available and visible for the inner eye uh, in the use of these plants and drugs. So shamans from all primal and conscious have used these drugs uh, to cure the patient. Then. And very often this is done in one day. Uh, still today there are experiments with LSD and on depressed patients and we know from from experiments, clinical experiments in London, that very often the uh, chronic, chronically depressed patients are cured in in, in one day. Uh, after uh, even after years, uh, when the doctors are coming back and, and 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 interviewing them, they say that this was what helped them. They they were depressed for ten or twenty years. They had this one session, and since then uh, things have have been good. So this is amazing, but of course it's extremely, extremely powerful, and it's like only for for for, for true experts. And, and again, you can see if you're a better therapist, you don't have to use it. You can just talk to the patients and make things happen. So this is also because we're kind of stupid that we need these kind of of tools. And as I said, the old Greek doctors they didn't use them. They didn't use any drugs. They didn't need to use these things because they 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 had this strong belief in love uh, and being present for the patients and that this was what cured so very often uh, they, they, they just came to level one in this staircase of, of techniques and that was, uh, that was sufficient. Level 10 is brute force. If the patient don't, uh, don't eat, you can force feed him or her. If they are doing crazy things, you can lock them up. Uh, these techniques are used in, in modern psychiatry. Uh, we also have surgeries, uh, drugs, electroshock therapy, all, all these like extremely violent techniques. They are, they are in this box. And, and we know that you cannot use these techniques without some level of harm to the patient. So uh, it's extremely sad that these techniques are so widely used and of course it reflects the sad fact that we do not, these days, work very well as, as selfish and doctors. The reason for that is that, that our self inside is too little. When we do not understand ourselves, we cannot understand our fellow man and we cannot help. So, my dear friend uh, Michael Wiebe in, uh, in Norway says that every doctor, every physician should start by improving the tool, which is yourself. Only by understanding yourself better can you become the therapist or the doctor you truly want to be.